Hello, I'm the Grizzly Cartographer, and this is the Watoga headquarters of the Atomic Mining Services. In this video, we're going to cover the Atomic Mining Services, their actions here in Watoga, and across the surrounding Cranberry Bog. We'll start with a quick inventory of the AMS sites in Appalachia. First and foremost, we've already mentioned the headquarters in Watoga. Watoga itself should likely be considered a part of it, since it's uh, due to AMS's involvement that it exists as it is. Next, the AMS site that we've covered most extensively so far in the lore video series, the AMS testing site near Welch. Though not in the Cranberry Bog, the testing site features prominently in the history of AMS, so we're going to cover a little bit of old ground in this video. Third, the Kerwood Mine, located at the northern end of the bog, near the edges of both the Savage Divide and the Mire. Fourth is the Old Mold Quarry, located to the east of Bogtown. Fifth is Quarry X3, located north of Watoga. Sixth is Drop Site C2, located just south of the Old Mold Quarry. Seventh is Drop Site G3, located just west of Quarry X3. Eighth is Drop Site V9, located just southeast of Watoga. Ninth is the Glass Cavern, the engines of which is just to the east of Drop Site V9. And tenth, Drop Site D4, which is the now destroyed Drop Site that sat above the main chamber of the Glass Cavern. With that general listing, let's move into the operations and personnel of Atomic Mining Services. We don't have a firm date on the founding of AMS. The closest thing we do have is a February 4th, 2042 date on the Watoga City Seal. Given the close relationship between Watoga and AMS, this is potentially an important date for AMS. We'll cover the real world Watoga in a future video. Just know for now the name is tied to two place names, Watoga State Park and an unincorporated area nearby the state park. To be clear, we don't know with 100% certainty that AMS was involved with Watoga at the time of its incorporation, but we also don't have any dates that are explicitly tied to the founding of AMS. We do know that compared to the older, family-owned Garahan Mining and Hornwright Industrial, AMS was a newcomer to Appalachia when they moved into the area. They brought atomic mining with them. The idea was simple. If you can blast with dynamite to increase your speed of progress while mining ore, why not use something bigger? In the real world, the United States and Soviet Union experimented with the concept of using nuclear bombs for peaceful purposes. The Soviets used a bomb to create Lake Shigan in modern Kazakhstan, and a few more in some quarries in a mine. Among the 928 bombs detonated at the Nevada test site northwest of Las Vegas, on July 6, 1962, the United States completed the Storex Sedan test shot in hopes of experimenting with the concept of digging canals and harbors with thermonuclear bombs. The crater created is 320 feet deep and 1,280 feet wide. As with all atomic bombs, the bombs spread radioactive fallout, and in this case, across parts of the United States. And eventually the idea of nuclear digging was abandoned. But let's get back to the fallout universe. After AMS used atomic bombs to dig, they discovered something unexpected. A green, glass-like material that formed near blast sites. They tested this green radioactive glass and they discovered that it had an incredible potential as a power source. They named the material Ultrasite and set about discovering the process by which it was created, conducting test detonations at sites around Appalachia. Testing on Ultrasite took place at both the mines and the AMS headquarters in Watoga. The AMS HQ was one of the more unique structures in Watoga. The main body of this structure is a vertical cylinder held high above the city by four long legs. The interior can be accessed via an elevator in the foyer that lies at the center of the traffic circle known as North Washington Street. Once in the lobby high above the city, the floors further up were accessible via a pneumatic tube system. For comparisons, think about those tubes that carry deposit slips and cash and checks between your car and the bank teller in a bank drive through except that these tubes were large enough for a person to ride through. An employee in the finance department by the name of Michael got stuck in these tubes multiple times. So much so that he was suspected of doing it on purpose, and it was recommended that he be fired. Whether he was personally planning on suing the company or not, his wife definitely seemed to be of the opinion that he should. And she even tried to get him to carry a recorder to document all the times he got stuck. Beyond the tube system, though, there was a good deal of research that took place in the headquarters. The main thrust of that work seems to have been animal testing. They exposed bears, mole rats, and cows to ultrasight and its radiation. In this way, AMS created Yaogwai, giant mole rats, and Brahmin well before the bombs came down. They also discovered that when depleted, ultrasite would react in a corrosive manner with undepleted ultrasite, making their separation necessary. AMS's belief that ultrasite could power the entire country was given a couple of boosts in the years before the war. In late 2076, Vivian Garahan signed a 10-year deal with AMS to purchase ultrasite. Garahan used this material to power their energy-hungry excavator power armor suits. Beyond this, the Poseidon Energy WV-06 power plant in Charleston converted from a coal-fired power plant to an ultrasite plant. I will note that there is a terminal there that claimed that they were burning ultrasite, but I think they're saying that figuratively, as ultrasite really does not work that way. Back to the headquarters though. Just as it was host to research, it also hosted the Board of Atomic Mining Services and its CEO, Kilson. From the CEO's terminal, we learned that one of the reasons that AMS worked with Robco to build Watoga was to tie the two companies' fortunes together. AMS wanted Robco's political connections for protection, and Kilson further believed that in playing such an integral part in the project such as Watoga, the company could hide some of its less savory business dealings in their minds. 
AMS was known to their miners to practice unsafe mining practices in their properties, as is greatly evident within the Kerwood mine. Foreman Sam Bailey noted that the coal there was being extracted faster than the proper structural support infrastructure could be created. This lax attitude toward safety would cost their workers greatly in the end. Kerwood Mine was also a site where nepotism proved a harmful force. Fireboss Roy Kerwood was both incompetently dangerous and a thief, stealing cash from the mine in such a way that Sam Bailey had to find new ways to lock it up to keep it from him. Kerwood Mine was one of the few sites that had not yet had its miners replaced by auto miners. Automation was greatly embraced by AMS, so much so that their lobby PA system erroneously refers to atomic mining services as automated mining services. In the summer of 2069, Penelope Hornwright, daughter of the mining magnate Daniel Hornwright, interned with the automation department. When Hornwright Industrial subsequently released their hugely successful auto miner, there were those at AMS who believed that Ms. Hornwright had stolen ideas from AMS. This belief was countered directly by AMS CEO Kilson, who sent a memorandum to the board explaining that she stole nothing from the company and was in fact responsible for their successful contracts with Hornwright Industrial. When AMS began to mine Ultrasite, they discovered that the auto miners were incapable of hauling it properly. This was an inefficiency that saved the jobs of some miners. Unfortunately for those who remained, they were no longer truly miners. They simply transported already mined ore, and their salary shrank as a result. The miners resented this loss of pay and began to sabotage the auto miners. Outside, most of AMS's sites were picketed by former miners. As part of AMS's plan to provide ultrasite for the mass market, they knew they'd have to find an efficient way to produce it. But the truth of the matter is that for a time, they didn't know fundamentally the process of how to create it in the first place. As part of the effort to learn how to make ultrasite, AMS detonated 11 test shots at a test site near the city of Welch. When these tests failed to produce ultrasite, AMS abandoned the site. On October 1st, 2077, the glassy green radioactive fruit of those tests burst forth, shattering Welch in the process. The vein of ultrasite ran all the way from the test site to Welch. When AMS arrived, they attempted to seize what they believed was their property, and the people of Welch revolted, followed shortly thereafter by many of the angry out-of-work miners across the region. Minor leaders Mick Flanagan and O'Connor set off against their enemies in Hornwright and AMS, with Flanagan taking the Rockhound on Mount Blair, while O'Connor was striking at the mega mansions of Bromwell. Had the miners succeeded in their earliest efforts, their goal would then have been to burn Watoga to the ground. On October 12th, 11 days after the riot started, the Rockhound was back in Hornwright's hands, and the miners had either been arrested, shot, or had dispersed. The unrest created by AMS's actions ended up squarely laid on the company's shoulders. Penelope Hornwright had spent her time during the riots making sure that AMS would be held liable for their actions. In Watoga, the receptionist at the headquarters was told not to discuss either Ultrasite or Welch. Despite their political connections, AMS was under pressure by the government, and this is possibly why they decided to go ahead with a series of coordinated nuclear detonations and their mines across the Cranberry Bog. They may have thought that they could smooth over the chaos they created by offering up a vast quantity of Ultrasite. Due to these blasts, most of the mines became more structurally strained. In Kerwood Mine, the detonations spelled doom. By October 17th, 2077, Foreman Sam Bailey noted that 17 of the miners had been killed immediately, and when the pump system failed, 32 more men were trapped behind cave-ins and the newly highly radioactive water. He and the structural engineer did all they could to try to rescue the miners, but they didn't have any real options. It was around this time that the new Appalachian Railroad train yard east of Watoga sank into the earth, resulting in a massive train wreck. As far back as August 2077, seismic tests in the area were showing instability. The NAR blamed AMS's test shots, but AMS wouldn't hear of it, blaming natural earthquakes for their troubles. This is not the only case of subsistence caused by AMS's tests. South of Watoga, Sunrise Field is a farm that has sunken unevenly into the ground. Drop sites C2 and G3 have both partially sunken as well. The abandoned bog town was condemned when much of it began to sink into the ground, and the ribbon of highway running through the city snapped. It seems that with these subterranean detonations, AMS seriously damaged the glittering jewel that they had created to hide those actions. Many of Otoka's buildings show signs of damage, potentially damage that predated the war. As I said in my video on the Municipal Center, I don't know for sure if this was caused by their activities before the war, but it seems highly likely. In the mine that would become the Glass Cavern, Foreman Grayson was attempting to keep the peace, knowing that the company was edging towards a full worker revolt. The men he oversaw hated him as management for bringing in the auto miners, while he was actually trying to save as many jobs as he could. When an atomic shot fell unintentionally at drop site D4, it caused a series of cave-ins. Grayson proved his devotion to his men, getting as many of them out as he could. He ended up alone, trapped in the mine. As he faced his impending death, he recorded his final thoughts of love for his wife, and he sang, You are my sunshine to her. We don't know exactly what happened in the AMS headquarters on October 22nd, 2077, when the robots of Watoga went haywire. In the top floor boardroom, it's clear that some sort of meeting was taking place between AMS and a potential combination of the civilian and military branches of government. At some point, the word went out to delete all the company files. 
The cause for this message is unknown, but it's conceivable that the law was finally catching up to AMS and its reckless actions in the Cranberry Bog and Welch. In the lobby, you can find a destroyed Protectron with a sign sporting the slogan, Caution, this machine has no brain. Use your own. This slogan is in tune with the ideology of the anti-automation movement, but as to who put it up and when it went up, that's unknown. One option that came to mind was that either Flanagan or O'Connor and their miners managed to escape the fighting in the ash heap and snuck into Watoga to carry out their plans. A possibility as to why the boardroom is full of skeletons is that given the close ties of AMS to the city, the security turrets that guarded the room may have been under central control. When Scott Turner caused the robotic revolt, it may have killed the men and women here. Regardless of the confusing aspects of what we find here, I think it's safe to say that the structure belonged to the dead by the morning of October 23rd. Two weeks later, on November 6, 2077, Foreman Sam Bailey of the Kerwood Mine contemplated suicide as he wrote his final log. The men trapped in the mine were dead, and the outside world was feeling the oncoming rush of nuclear winter. He wrote to the potential reader saying, I hope the world isn't as effed up as it seems. If it is, I feel sorry for you. Years later, both the flooded NAR train yard and Kerwood Mine would have scouts from the Brotherhood of Steel come through. At their headquarters, AMS received a visitor from over the mountains. Hank Madigan, second in command of the Fire Breathers Detachment of the Responders. He visited the site and used what he learned there about Ultrasight to help the responders craft weapons more capable of taking down the Scorched. Though we don't know precisely when, sometime after the war the glass cavern became a laboratory site for the Enclave. It was there, in the ruins left over by the accidental detonation of Drop Site D4, that the Enclave accidentally created the Scorched Beasts. President Eckhart ordered the breeding of those monsters, and eventually their release in 2086. It was at this site that the seeds of the destruction of post-war Appalachia were sown. The Appalachian Brotherhood of Steel conducted their final mission, Operation Touchdown, in this cavern. And it was here that their leader, Paladin Elizabeth Taggarty, fell. The actions of AMS truly shaped the final days of pre-war Appalachia, and their ruins would serve as the cradle to the terror of the skies. Before we leave this focused look at AMS behind, we need to consider a potential timeline issue with Watoga and Robco's founding date. Watoga was founded, or at least incorporated, as a municipality on February 4th, 2042, according to the city seal. Robco was founded June 25th, 2042 by Robert House on his 22nd birthday, at least according to his autobiographical obituary in Fallout New Vegas. In determining if I can resolve this, I came to the following conclusion. It's entirely possible that the city of Watoga, regardless of the involvement of AMS, was incorporated on February 4th, 2042, with Robco coming on board later. The only hiccup of this theory is that the letter that was sent to the randomly selected mayor has the date February 4th, 2042. The only answer I can think of for this is that the date of incorporation was included in every letter regardless of the actual delivery date. Otherwise we have a lore conflict here, as the mayoral artificial intelligence assistant is mentioned in the letter. In Maya it was created by Robco at the research facility nearby that cannot have existed over four months before the company even existed. I hope that that cleared up this issue. As a final side note, when the United States detonated its first atomic bomb on July 16th, 1945, a glassy green material was created at the site, Trinitite. It's been theorized that the sand on the ground beneath the bomb was actually drawn into the nuclear fireball and fell as molten glass loaded with bits of the bomb and the testing apparatus. I mention this because it reminds me to an extent of Ultrasight, as the material is crystalline, green, and radioactive, albeit lightly radioactive. I think that'll do it for AMS. In the next video, we're going to cover the fall of Watoga on October 22nd, 2077. Thanks for watching. I'll see you again next time.